Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host Paul, aka George RR Spoilins, and this video we're breaking down the Game of Thrones prequel, House of the Dragon. The new HBO show is packed with easter eggs, callbacks or call forwards, and a lot of big characters that we're going to be analysing in this video. The entire series is based on the final third part of Fire and Blood, which tells the tale of the Targaryen lineage, all duking it out to take their place on the Iron Throne. As we know, come Game of Thrones, the entire house was left almost extinct, and this series will be talking about how the House of Cards all came crashing down. Beginning at Chapter 12's Heirs of the Dragon, the original work recounts all the ins and outs of the family tree, and it basically gives you the idea, if you want to be happy living a king's life, never make a pretty niece your wife. Now whether, so bad, now whether you've read it or not, it doesn't really matter, as this breakdown will be covering it all, and after becoming an expert on it last night, what, did, did no one else do the reading? Well, I'm here to give you the ins and outs on every single character. Because of this, there might be some spoilers, but I promise you that I'll not give away any of the big twists or deaths in this video. I just want to really use the book to add some insight to the characters. If you read it, then you'll know that it's more like a textbook rather than being a story, and because of this, it's a bit of a slog to get through. There's massive pages that just basically list character names, talk about them for a bit, and then that's it. However, it actually gives the series a big advantage as it means they can pick certain sections and expand on them massively. They have a few plot points that they have to stick to, but beyond that they can really go wild with it and it leads to this being such a good first episode. Now, the show takes place roughly 172 years before the death of the Mad King and the birth of Daenerys. We start by joining King Jaehaerys, who had a reign of prosperity and peace after the first 100 years of Targaryen rule. However, all good kings must come to an end, and when his health starts to fail, he has to choose an heir. This is basically where the disputes all stem from, and this show will be going over people vying for who should be the rightful ruler. As we learn in this opening chapter, which is narrated by an old Rhaenyra, women were completely looked over, and the right to rule often fell to the males, even if they weren't direct descendants. Now, Jaehaerys and his wife Queen Alysanne produced 13 children, with only 4 of these growing to maturity, marrying and producing children of their own. Unfortunately, Jaehaerys and Alysanne's two sons died, and rather than passing the rule on to one of his daughters, he ended up choosing her cousin Viserys, who's played by Paddy Constantine. You might recognise the name Viserys if you're a Game of Thrones fan, and Danny's brother was also called this too. Now, Alysanne believed that Jaehaerys should choose a queen, and she actually fell out with him because he refused to do it. There's a great quote in the book where she says, Ahem. A ruler needs a good head and a true heart. A cock is not essential. If your grace truly believes that women lack the wit to rule, plainly you have no further need of me. Amazing impressions there. And Alison actually then flew to Dragonstone on her dragon Silverwing, and the two remained apart for two years. This was known as the second quarrel, but Jahera stood his ground and still refused to budge. The choice is what we see playing out here, and it very much fractures the entire family. Now, due to all the peace and prosperity that the Targaryens had during this time, they actually managed to have lots and lots of children. This ended up leading to 14 potential people who all had a right to the throne, and because of this, the next ruler was highly coveted. It was actually predicted that so many heirs would lead to so much confusion, and this would eventually cause what would be known as the Dance of the Dragons. Now, whilst this sounds like a great little party, it's actually describing the battle for the Iron Throne, which led to a lot of bloodshed. We get this great quote early on that pretty much prophesizes everything that's to come. The only thing that could tear down the house of the dragon was itself. Now here we also see Rhaenys, who comes to be known as the queen who never was. She becomes somewhat of a mentor to Rhaenyra, which we'll talk about more as we get into the season. Now from here we cut to the title scene, which has the Targaryen banner on it that you'll probably recognise from Game of Thrones. We next get a big time jump to pick up in Viserys' ninth year of rule. Here we join Rhaenyra riding on the back of her dragon Cyrax, which was known for its yellow scales. It swoops through King's Landing, and this scene is very reminiscent of Danny's attack during Season 8. This time though, she's just here to check out the view, and we get several monuments and little details in the location. Firstly, she passes the Red Keep, and you might notice that there's some scaffolding on it because it's still under construction. Next, we see the Dragon Pit, which is still intact. This is where the houses all met during Game of Thrones, but it was pretty run down, whereas here it's back to its full glory. As I'm sure you can guess, yeah, Captain Obvious, dragons were kept here, and it was often theorised that this stunted their growth due to keeping them confined. You also see some Targaryen banners before Rhaenyra drops in. 
I love the way this is shot so we don't actually see her and she drops down evoking images of Danny due to her hair and dress. We even get some notes from Game of Thrones reused in this journey to bring back good memories of the show. They were all good, they were all good memories, F forget about the rest. Now here we also meet Sir Harold Westerling, played by Grey McTavish. Westerling is a character that served in the King's God back in the old days of Jaehaerys, and since then he's carried forth this idea of honour and chivalry. Really upstanding bloke, and next we meet Alicent. Alicent is the hand of the King's daughter, and she ends up taking care of Viserys come the end of the entry. This is a very important part of the story, as it basically allows her to get a foot in the door down the line. Now I don't want to spoil too much, but Otto making sure that she comforts him has some big ramifications and this meeting early on between the two characters is very important. Next we travel through the streets of King's Landing and pass a statue of a dragon. I'm not 100% sure who this is, but I believe that it might be Balerion the Black Dread, which is why the monument is coloured this way. They then go to the Red Keep, which is nice and red like that subscribe button, after you hit it and the thumbs up as well, you damn son of a bitch. Now we watch as Alisan and Rhaenyria travel through the keep and there's that bit that you recognise from that bit. There's that bit from then. Shout out to our editor Matt for putting this all together. Now here we meet her mother Emma who ends up dying in the entry along with her son Balin. The books talked about how he lived for a day and this insult ends up being brought into his nickname, Heir for a Day. Sadly, we don't really get much with the baby and just see the pair on the funeral pyre together. It's one of the most heartbreaking moments in Game of Thrones history and watching the entire birth scene had me squirming as Viserys' ambition ends up driving him to choose his unborn son over his wife. Now she very much shows why Rhaenyra wants to become more than just a walking womb. Though it was a queen's duty back then to give birth, Rhaenyra sees firsthand what her mother's death was caused by all in the service of trying to have a male heir. I also think she's a bit angry how this unborn child has more right to the throne than she does because at the moment it's Schrodinger's baby and might not even be a male. We see that Emma has been through a lot and discover that she's lost many children. From here we cut at the small council, looking exactly the same as how it did in the original series. Here we see Lord Corlys Valerian, played by Steve Toussaint. You can catch his seahorse crest on his chest and his house ended up building the largest navy in the world. They also gained a vast fortune that made them even richer than the Lannisters. You also get this very important line here. A man called Kragas Drehar has styled himself the Prince Admiral of this triarchy. They call him the Crab Feeder. I think the Crab Feeder is going to be one of the big characters this season and he was teased at in the trailer. He basically tied his victims to wooden pyres that were stuck in the sand and allowed the tides to come in so that the crabs could feast on them. We also see Otto here and he can catch his hand of the King Badge, which of course also popped up in the main show. Now Rhaenyra comes in and Viz calls her his cupbearer. This pulls directly from the book and in that we learn that she was given this role at the age of 8. The passage says at table, at tourney and at court that the king was seldom seen without his daughter. This passage also discusses how she was trained to ride dragons at the age of 7, showing how many years she's had experience of this. You also see Lord Lyman Beesbury, the master of coin and he brings up how Damon is absent. Now Damon pretty much embodies the saying of how whenever a Targaryen is born that the gods toss a coin. He's described in the book as being cruel and ruthless and they discuss how he cut the hands off of thieves which we actually see playing out in this entry. Now Damon's the younger brother of the king and he possesses the true blood of the dragon. Viz never had a living son and this made him believe that he should be the rightful heir. However, his brother completely overlooks him and at one point he caused a lot of issues with his mistress Miseria. She's played by Sonia Mizuno, who you might recognise from Devs and Ex Machina. She's nicknamed Misery and will probably play a big part in things going forward. A Damon makes one hell of an entrance and the first time we meet him, he's sat in the Iron Throne. This is clearly symbolising his quest to sit there officially and it sums up the entire character in this opening shot of him. The original work had it as a throne with a staircase of swords leading up to it, but the first series turned that down. Thus, these guys had to keep in line with that too, but they kind of do build the sword staircase, merging the series and book together. Now, if you're picking up on some sexual tension here, then hey, you might be onto something. Now, he has brought her a gift, namely some Valerian steel. This metal is so strong that when it's forged into a sword, it can stay sharp forever, like my dad jokes. Hey! Ha <laughs> Now, we cut to Alicent and Rhaenyria sitting, going through the history books beside some weirwood. The faces on them were carved by the children of the forest 
and they ended up having to flee north once the first men came to the continent and started a war. These trees were later worshipped by the first men, and they were meant to be shrines for the gods of the forest. We hear the mention of the name Nymeria, a sort of warrior princess, that could end up inspiring the direction that they go with Rhaenyria. She rips out a page from the book, showing she's got no chill when it comes to tradition. This of course also fits in with a woman sitting on the Iron Throne, and f*** the sun baby, a queen is coming soon. Now we cut to Viz getting seen to due to a cut on his back. He then says this line. It's a small cut from sitting the throne. It's nothing. Now this was actually something that was the case with the chair, and the kings had to sit in a certain position to avoid getting cut by the sharp blades on it. We even see this at the end when the king cuts his finger due to the blade on the armrest. The blood on the throne is of course symbolic, and it's very much a metaphor for the bloodshed that's about to come. Now as for the wound on his back, I'm not 100% sure what this is, and we even had some talk in the heavy spoilers office that it could be grayscale. Whether it is or not, I don't know, but I think it's put in place to show that the king's health is failing. After a tender moment with his wife in which she says this is the last time, the stakes that this is the last chance for a male heir are planted in his mind. Sadly, we know that it would have been a boy, but due to his death, the heirs all line up to stake their claim. Now we cut to the knight and see Damon and his forces clearing up the streets before the tournament begins. It's very much done as an act of terror to show the peasants who's in charge, and it cements what kind of king that Damon would be. Damon is of course a play on the word demon, and he's introduced in a paragraph that describes him carrying out these cruel acts. It says he slits the noses of thieves, chop the d**ks off of all words that unfortunately I can't say because it gets you demonetized on YouTube, and all round he just does what he wants. We see it all play out here, and the book also describes him as being someone who frequents wine sinks, gambling pits, and the brothels, which is where he meets Miseria. Now the raid is super violent, and I love the costume design on Damon's helmet. It's shaped like a dragon with a head at the top and the wings around his face. The raid causes a lot of issues, and it very much splits the sides that support him, potentially becoming the heir. He clearly makes an enemy of Otto, and proper does him later on, when he takes the favour of Alison at the games. God damn, the disrespect, god damn. Now we also get a mention of Lady Rhea, who in the book comes from the House of Royce. Damon didn't want to marry her, and he completely detests having her as his wife. However, they did have a house solidarity, due to her being the heir to the ancient castle of Runestone. Damon much prefers the misery that he has in the brothels, which leads to him publicly trying to have a relationship with Miseria. We catch up with her getting banged, and I heard she was looking for a doctor who appreciated that she was bigger on the inside. I thought my jokes were bad. And next, we see a tournament playing out similar to the one that featured early on in Game of Thrones. Whereas that introduced the mountain, here we meet the knight Kristen Cole. He becomes somewhat of a love interest for the young princess, and it's likely going to cause a love triangle with him and her uncle. Now, the book cites this as being an event that saw Damon and Kristen going head to head, with the latter taking the win. It's described as being a humiliation for him, with Kristen knocking Dark Sister from Damon's hands with his weapon Morningstar. Now this is riffing on the tournament of Maidenpool, which was held when Viserys took his ascension. Here it's put in place to welcome his new son, and it's supposed to be a day of celebration that sadly ends in tragedy. Feel really bad for Viserys, as he genuinely was a nice king that looked after his people. He wanted nothing more than to carry on the prior king's legacy, and to create a dominion of peace and prosperity. However, due to all the heirs that were created under this, it made it impossible and much like how the joust was one of the last happy moments in the original GOT, this likely will be too. Now here we meet a Baratheon, an ancestor of Robert, who would go on to become the king in the first season. He was a bloody said, was a great guy, skewed by a boar, and I don't mean me when I say it was a boar. Ha <laughs> ha! That actually was a really good impression though. I'm proud of that one. Now, they just kind of seem to push the events together as Kristen took the favour of Rhaenyria when she was seven, which, bit weird that mate. So yeah, glad they avoided that here with it taking place much later in the timeline. Sadly, the celebration is cut short with Emma going through a lot of issues during her pregnancy. We hear that she's given milk of the poppy, which is a Game of Thrones staple given to help ease pain. We had my guy vomiting, which is what I was doing watching this gore on the battlefield, and the pain that Emma was going through. It's such a devastating way to start the series, and it shows us that this series will not be f***ing around. Killing not only a pregnant woman, but also a baby. You've got to have balls to do that in the first episode, and yet, yeah, really messed up. Congratulations, Your Grace. You have a son. 
Even the congratulations here feels so devastating and it rips your heart out when you see him on the pyre too. In Targaryen fashion, a dragon is used to burn the bodies and after they were cremated, they were placed into a sept. You also get this bit, Dracarys. which means dragon fire in High Valerian. It's also what Danny, of course said during the series when she wanted stuff to kick off. Now, sadly, Viz is forced that night to discuss a new heir for the stability of the realm. Damon is put forward, but Otto argues against it. We hear how he sabotaged his career, and Viz also says that his brother doesn't really have the patience to be king. Oh, he's, he's listening in, isn't he? Well, they bring up that he'd be a, a second Magar, who was a Targaryen known for his ferocity. Nicknamed Magar the Cruel, he lived for war and murder, and the raids would become commonplace if Damon got in a position of power. The arguments here very much set up the Greens versus Blacks, and this basically had people choosing allegiances between Daemon and Rhaenyria. The Blacks were known as the party of the princess and they supported Rhaenyria, which is who we see showing up at the end once she's named heir. In the King's Chamber, we catch him building models and it reminded me a lot of when dudes, you know, they just play with model trains. My guy has made a pretty good recreation though and he finds some comfort in his new girl. Now the pair had lots of visits together in the books and they grow really close in the absence of his wife. After Damon's heir for a day celebration, Viserys calls him forth and we see him on the throne along with his sword Blackfire. This was an ancestral weapon of the Targaryens carried by the kings throughout their conquests. This insult really pushes the king over the edge and it's the final straw that makes him choose an heir. Damon tells him straight and says that he's a weak king who gets preyed upon, but he tells him to return home and that Raina will become the heir instead. How'd you like them apples? Aviz goes to a giant dragon skull, evoking images of Cersei going to one in the main series. He meets Rhaenyria and tells her the knowledge that she needs to be a ruler and imparts in her mind that dragons can't be controlled. He apologises for wishing for a son whilst she was there and we watch as she's clothed by Alicent. Really important scene as this friendship doesn't last too long once the politics come into it and the divide between the two grows more and more as we get deeper into their history. Whilst Rhaenyria gets her allegiances, we see Misery visiting Damon, and it very much speaks to the misery that's soon to follow. Boo, you suck. The pair leave together which ties into the issues we were talking about before and that will no doubt show up next time. Now, the king very much brings up a dream by Aegon that talks about winter coming from the north. This would of course play into the main series and we even get a cameo by a Stark whilst he goes through this. Said to be the great winter, this has the potential to wipe out the world of men if a Targaryen isn't sat on the Iron Throne. Now it's obviously setting up the White Walkers and along with what I believe is Jon Snow. He's said to unite the realms against this and it's known as the Song of Ice and Fire. Might have my analysis off there so I'm not good at interpreting dreams. So let me know below if you have your own thoughts and theories on who it could be. But yeah, that's who I took it as. Now he grips the Valerian steel dagger and if this looks familiar, it's because it's the blade that was used to kill the Night King. Really sets up things beautifully and it ends this brilliant entry. Now as for my thoughts on the first episode, I really enjoyed it and kind of going back to the heat, straight heat I got for saying She-Hulk was mid, I think this is how you kickstart a series. It's got a lot of big moments in it, introduces some intriguing characters, has progression and also feels like they put all they could into making sure that this was something memorable. I have to say, I was someone who felt a bit disappointed with season 8 of Game of Thrones. Yes, I, I, know, I know there's not that many of us. And uh, yeah, even after buying the 4K set to rewatch them last year, it definitely felt like a low point that kind of ruined all the goodwill that people had for the series. However, something about that theme playing up, seeing the dragons swooping through King's Landing, it all brought back the feeling of why I fell in love with the show in the first place. The prequel did such a great job of instantly placing us back into that world that it's difficult not to admire it. Even though it's all new characters, you can see how their characteristics would carry over to their ancestors and it's really well thought out and put together. Like I said, I think the book is pretty basic in its storytelling with it being used more as a way to describe all the different houses. But they really brought it to life and made me appreciate the original text in a way that I never really had before. The first episode was a great way to kick things off and I can't wait to see what happens next time. The Lord of the Rings show has a lot to do to match this and it's going to be interesting to see who comes out on top in this game of clones. Anyway, that's the video. Save the worst pun to last, but I hope you enjoyed it. I'd obviously love to hear your thoughts below and if there's anything we missed or that you feel should be talked about more, then drop it below. Also probably made a lot of mistakes as well. So uh, yeah, the, the comment section's yours. 
Do your worst. Now we are only in competition right now and giving away three copies of Top Gun Maverick on the 15th of September and all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random on the 15th and the winners of the last one are on screen right now. So if that's you, then message us on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else to watch, make sure you check out our breakdown of She-Hulk, which will be linked on screen right now. Lots of cool easter eggs in it, things that call back to the comics, and yeah, I might not have had the best of time, but uh, it's a video that I think is definitely worth watching. If not, then thanks for sticking through this one, and I hope to see you on the next one. Take care, peace.